Good morning to you all. It's great to be here with you today. I want to start with a question. Have you ever wished that you could be in more than one place at a time? Uh, maybe, for example, getting more done by being in multiple places. Maybe you could be at work getting your job done while you're also at home spending time with your family. Wouldn't that be wonderful? God can be in more than one place at a time. Today, we're going to be looking at how the omnipresence of God means that he is one who sees, who hears, and who understands us. Now, omnipresent, broken down very simply, uh, just means present everywhere simultaneously. The word omni is a Latin word that means all. So God is present in all places at the same time. Now, it's interesting, the word omnipresent, you won't find it in your Bible, not in that specific phrasing. But the Bible has many references that clearly show that he is present in all places at the same time. Uh, it's one of the three omni qualities of God that display his greatness. My wife Sarah has been looking at these in the children's stories the last three weeks, that God is omnipotent, he's all powerful. God is omniscient, meaning that he knows everything. And this also God is omnipresent. He is everywhere at the same time. Now, it takes faith to believe that God is everywhere at the same time. It's a hard concept to understand because we humans are not everywhere at the same time. We can't even be two places at one time. And we can see no other thing that is in more than one place at the same time. We will never understand the concept of the omnipresence of God with our natural mind. It will never just make sense to us. God told us this in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 9. He said, My thoughts and my ways are as high above yours as outer space is from the earth. Now that's a huge amount of difference. There's a lot of math behind that. We're not going to go through that today. But just very simply, uh, light travels around the earth at about seven and a half times every second. So if you say one Mississippi, there's one second. Light just went around the earth seven and a half times. The universe, or as far as man can tell anyways, if you multiply that number 7.5 times how many? 60 seconds in a minute times 60 minutes in an hour times 24 hours in a day times 365 days in a year, you have one light year. And the universe is billions of light years across. So God says, my thinking and my ways are like as high as the heavens above the earth are compared to the way that you think. God is not just slightly bigger or smarter than us. He's vastly greater. There is no comparison. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the size of God. Because in order to help us comprehend that God is present in all places at the same time, we have to have a basic understanding of the size of God. And we're going to look at a few verses in Isaiah chapter 40. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible because of how it portrays some, some mind-blowing facts about the greatness of God. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 12, it says that God measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. Now this part of your hand is the hollow of your hand. So God, it means that he measures all the waters of the earth in this little cup of his hand. Isaiah 40 verse 12 also says that God marked off the heavens with the span of his hand. A span is this distance, that God measures the entire heavens, the whole universe we talked about, the billions of light years from here to here on his hand. Isaiah 40 verse 12 also says that God weighed all the dirt and mountains that are on earth. I was carrying a bucket of dirt earlier today. If you've ever carried a bucket of dirt, it's, it's decently heavy. But God can weigh all the dirt on the earth and all the mountains. Isaiah 40 verse 15 says that God picks up the earth like a grain of sand, like a tiny, tiny little speck. God is able to pick up the earth just like that. So we've established that God is huge by these things, that he can measure the water in the cup of his hand, measure the universe with the span of his hand, weigh the earth, pick it up like a grain of sand. 
And I think God is, the size of God is, is greater than we could ever really imagine. But although he's big enough for all these things, so big that the Bible says heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain him, yet he humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. This is what the psalmist said in Psalms 33, verses 13 and 14. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees the whole human race. From his throne, he observes all who live on the earth. God is observing all the people who live on the earth. We were watching a, a video the other day. We had it playing on our screen at home of a live view of the earth from a satellite that was going around the earth. And, and I was just thinking as the satellite was going around, you know, we could see um, probably parts of countries, certain landscapes, but we couldn't really see detail uh, that, that was on the earth, nothing real specific. And we could not see people by any means that were on the earth. We could only see one tiny part at a time. But God, it says that he looks down and looks at all the people that are on the earth. And it's not that God has some sort of amazing eyesight, but what this verse is referring to is that God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. So even though the heavens and the, the heavens cannot contain him, yet he is able to be with all the people of the earth. Interesting fact. And then he became Emmanuel, God with us. Think about that. Jesus, the creator of all things, the Bible says in Colossians 1 verse 16, came to earth to dwell with his creation, God with us. And Jesus told his disciples and the rest of his followers for all the ages, he said, I am with you always to the end of the age. God with us. And even more, God, and specifically Christ, dwells in his people. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, I looked up the word dwell in the original, and it means to house permanently. The NLT version says that he will make his home in your hearts. And the thought for a home is to be near. For many of us, a home is the place where we love to be. We love to go home at the end of the day, or at the end of a trip, we come home. Well, it's that thought, the verse carries that thought that God loves to dwell with his people. It's like coming home. God loves being with us and in us. And actually the rest of Ephesians chapter 3 talks about God, about being rooted and grounded in the love of God so that we can even begin to understand the love that Christ has for us, a love that goes beyond our comprehension. God is the one who is so huge that heaven cannot contain him, dwells with his people on earth, because he loves them. He loves you. He loves me. And he cares about each one of us. And that's the part that I want to talk about today, specifically about the omnipresence of God. Now that we've established how great God is, but that he also dwells in and with people because he cares about them. We want to talk today specifically about the God who sees, the God who hears, and the God who understands. Because God is omnipresent and is aware of what is going on at all times, he sees, he hears, he understands everything about each one of our lives. When I was putting together my notes for this, I was, I was reminiscing back to when my firstborn, Titus, was a, a baby. And I remember listening to his baby monitor that we had at that time. And we would, you know, would hear him crying through the monitor. And, uh, and I remember thinking... My baby is in the room next to me crying, but he doesn't know that I am listening to him right now. He couldn't comprehend that we were right next door listening. He had no idea as a baby. He couldn't see when we peeked around the corner to check on him, to look at him and make sure he was okay. He didn't understand that we understood his circumstances as his parents and what he was going through. And to me, that's a great example. So I remember thinking at that time, you know, this is like God with us. Sometimes we're going through things and we don't think about or realize that God is able to hear us. He's able to see us. He's able to understand everything that we're going through, even though 
we may not always realize that or think about it. If you were watching a bit ago, you heard my wife Sarah talk about Joseph in the children's message. God saw Joseph in every one of his difficulties. God heard Joseph's cries and he heard his prayers. God understood all that Joseph was going through. But even though he understood the difficulty that Joseph was facing, he didn't set him free from that until the right time. So our human mind would think if God saw and heard Joseph's difficulty, wouldn't God have just set him free from that? But God knew what was best for Joseph and his whole family. And Joseph being in this circumstance actually saved his family by providing them food later on in their life. So this is also part of the understanding of God. When he sees us, he hears us and knows what we're going through. He understands his purposes for what we're going through as well. I want to look with you today at another biblical example that clearly shows that God sees and hears and understands everything that happens in our life. I want to look with you at somebody in the Bible named Hagar. Now, the background of this story is that Abraham and Sarah couldn't have children. So they thought it was a great idea for Abraham to have a child with Sarah's servant, Hagar. When Hagar got pregnant, it created some relationship issues between Sarah and Hagar. And Abraham told Sarah to do as she wished. So Sarah started treating Hagar so cruelly that she ran away. And this is where we pick up in the story. God appeared to Hagar and made it very clear to her that he saw and heard and understood exactly what she was going through. The first part of this that God saw her, we find in Genesis 16, verse 7. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, is what it says. Now, first, I want to point out here that the angel of the Lord in this passage refers to God himself. And we know this because verse 10 says the, that the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your offspring. That's not something that a regular, an angel could do, but this is God himself saying, I am going to do this for you. Now, it was not by chance that God happened upon Hagar, that God was just out for a walk and happened upon this lady who, who had run away from her, her, from her mistress. That wasn't chance. God knew right where she was because God saw her. He is the God who sees everything. Now, the second part that God hears, we find in Genesis 16, verse 11. It says, The Lord hath heard thy affliction. The Lord hath heard thy affliction. Hath heard is two words in the original. The first word means to hear intelligently and attentively. The second word means a motion toward or to be near. So when it says the Lord hath heard, the picture that I get from these words in the original is God listening attentively with understanding, kind of like with his ear or his hand cupped over his ear as he draws a little closer, paying attention to what is going on in Hagar's life. God specifically heard and paid attention to her affliction. And if you are experiencing turmoil or difficulty like Hagar, I want you to know that God hears. God pays attention to that. The third point that we find from the story of Hagar is that God understands. In Genesis 16, verse 13, it says, So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing, she said. Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. So Hagar, in the original, she called God el Roi. This is the first, the only time that this name of God appears in the Bible. It simply means the God who sees me. Now, the, the ESV version that we just read brings out the thought that Hagar is portraying. It's not just God is, is looking at her, but rather that God is looking after her. God is caring for her in an understanding way. And she says, he is the God who sees my every need. He understands what I am going through. God is a God who looks after people and he understands every difficulty. He understands every need. I want to look today at one more example from the, from the Bible, and that is with David. 
And we're going to look at Psalm chapter 139, uh, a, a common passage here that people look at when they, when they look at the topic of God being present everywhere at the same time. And I want to consider from what David said, whether God's presence with him was comforting or fearful for him. In Psalm 139, we're not going to read through it, but just reference what some of the points he says are in this passage. In verse 1, he says, God searches me. God knows me. In verse 2, he says, God knows when I sit and when I stand up. In verse 2, he also said, God knows my thoughts in my head. In verse 3, he says, God knows where I walk and lay down. In verse 4, he says, that God knows what I am going to say even before the words have come out of my mouth. In verse 8, David said, He's with me in the greatest height and in the lowest depth. In verse 9, he said, God is with me in the farthest reaches of the earth. There's no place that I can go on earth where God is not. In verses 11 and 12, he said that God shines in darkness. In other words, I can't hide in the dark from him. Because God is light. In verse 15, he said that God saw me when I was formed in the womb. And then in verses 17 and 18, after saying all these things about how God saw him, sees him, knows him, he said, How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. See, it could have been a fearful thing for David knowing that God was always with him, that God knew everything about him. But David was excited about it. He said, you're still with me. I wake up in the morning and Lord, you're still there and I love it. And the conclusion of the psalm, this psalm of David, he said in verses 23 and 24, that he said, Lord, search me. You already know, you already see everything about me. And the thought David is saying is, show me what you see. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my ways and see if there's anything wrong in me and lead me in the right way. So his conclusion was, after considering all these ways that God is with him and knows about him, was that he was comforted. But he also had a reverence and respect for God and said, God, search me. And if there's something in me that's not right, Show it to me. So what is this idea, this topic of, the God, of God being everywhere? What does that mean for you and me? And the question that I ask myself and you can ask yourself is, is the omnipresence or the presence of God everywhere, is that a fearful thing for me or is that a comforting thing? For Joseph, for Hagar, and for David, it was comforting. That didn't mean life was easy for them necessarily. Things were still difficult at times, but God's presence and direction with them was a comfort. So whether the thought of God knowing everything about you and seeing you where you are is fearful to make you scared or to make you nervous, or whether it's comforting, that often depends on me. It depends on us. Whether the thought is fearful or comforting depends on our perspective of God. And it depends on how we are living. If we're living in a way that that we know we're doing what pleases God, it should be a wonderful blessing and comfort to us to know that God is with us, taking care of us. If we're doing things that we know are wrong, it should give us a, a, a check or a pause for us to remember that God sees and hears those things that are done in secret. See, it shouldn't make us scared of God, but rather it should help us to live in a holy fear or a reverence of the Lord, knowing that God is right there with us all the time. The great difference actually between fear and comfort at the thought of the presence or of God being with us is found in Jesus Christ. The Bible says this in 1 John chapter 4, verses 15 and 17. All who confess that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, And they live in God. And verse 17, And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. So there's two very important things from this passage 
on the presence of God being a comfort to us. First, we must confess that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the very first thing in verse 15. But second, it says, then we will live in God. And as that happens, our love for God should grow. And when that happens, it causes us to become more and more like Jesus as our love for him grows because he's living in us. So God with us and in us should be changing us to become more and more like him. And then God with us is a comfort. We don't walk in fear, it says. Love casts out fear. We don't have to fear that God sees us and knows us because our love for him through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and living in us is growing. So in conclusion, God sees us. God hears us. God understands us. Do we want this to be a fearful thing or a comforting thing? And I know for me, I want it to always be a comfort that God is there. So a few points in conclusion, specific application. If you don't know Jesus as your savior, the first thing it says in 1 John 4, 15 is we have, you have to confess that he is the son of God to have God come live in you and to experience that comfort. But for anybody else, if you already confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but recognize and know that there are times that you'd rather not have God see and hear you, then I encourage you after this video service is done, after it's turned off, spend some time with God. Go to your secret place and repent of whatever that is. If you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, but you know that, that you do things that you wouldn't want God to see, go to him about that and say, Lord, I'm sorry, and confess it to him. And for all of who believe in Jesus, it's important, this thought of God being with us, that we thank him, that he is always with us. The Bible says we can cast our cares on him because he cares for us. These right now are some difficult times, but know that God is right there with you in whatever you may be facing. And we can thank him for that. And like David, it's important also that we ask the Lord to search us, to see if there's any wrong way in us and to lead us in the way everlasting. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are always with us. No matter where we go and what we do, you know us, you see us, you hear us, you care about us. And Lord, we are so thankful for that, for how much you love each one of us. And God, I ask that you would help us to cast our cares on you because you care for us. And Lord, like David cried in the Psalms, Lord, would you search us? Would you know our hearts? Would you see if there's any wicked way in us and reveal that to us to help us to walk with you, to help our love for you grow more and more as we walk for you and as we live for you and as we serve you. Search us, O oh God. In your name, amen.